verify these. You know, we'd, we'd like to be able to trust them, but um, you know, this is this is your part. This is your name on the line. And so you need to you need to confirm that you know, what's critical to your parts has actually been machined, so that you can ensure uh, correct performance of your device, make sure it's effective. So at the same time, 3D printing brings in the, a new way for us to make quick prototypes. It's a great way to evaluate pieces of quality of design and getting a part in your hand for evaluation. What's great is that, you know, it's great, maybe not so great, is that you can print geometries that you might otherwise not be able to, uh, to produce um, in a cost-effective manner. You know, some features you may not be able to produce at all with traditional machining techniques, you know, milling or turning. Um, so be sure you think hard about the features in your design. Uh, you know, think about the tools required, the drill, the drill bit, this femur, the brooch. Um, make sure you think about all these elements when you when you put together your design. Next slide. So. Design for manufacturer is a balancing act. You want to ensure you have a robust product, but can't forget that uh, what's on that what's on paper is not the only thing that's important. You have to make sure it's something you can manufacture. Make sure it's something your quality team is going to be able to inspect, verify those critical features and dimensions. Um, it's a cost effective, or you know. Are, have we made this device as, you know, as complex as it needs to be and as simple as it needs to be, that we can keep costs down? And if, you know, if you couldn't tell already, R and D manufacturing should be collaborating, you know, as much as possible here. Right? You can have a design, you can have a great concept, you can have the best concept, but if you can't make it, then you get the back to the drawing board. Right. That takes up, that wastes time, that wastes your time, you know, that wastes the company's time, that wastes company's money. You know, always, always include manufacturing uh, in your design efforts. And, you know, finally, make sure you're still meeting your customers' needs. You know, at the end of the day, that's what's most important. So, uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Sarkis. Uh, he'll, he'll talk about the, the prototypes we've developed. Uh, and I do have to step off the line. So well, thank you very much. Um, this is great. And if, if you have any you know, other questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me. That's my contact information. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, so a lot of very detailed concept is presented about uh, how to design for manufacture. Some of them we used, some of them not, because uh, this is not a, a mass production, this is just a production of uh, prototypes. And uh, we did it, we um, publicated, we managed to publicate a, a batch consisting of uh, seven, uh, not eight, eight prototypes. Uh, uh, complete uh, kit, uh, including the accessories for uh, uh, insertion, surgical accessories for insertion. I just want to uh, name some challenges uh, that we encountered uh, during this process. Uh, first of all, it was uh, difficult to find a producer, but because um, here the production companies are afraid of uh, dealing with this material, titanium, it's, they say it's difficult to uh, machine. Um, but I think that uh, here uh, the corresponding appropriate uh, tools should be uh, used and appropriate parameters, cutting parameters should be used that we unfortunately still don't use. And finally we found uh, Haikola, its company, uh, manufacturing company that uh, agreed to uh, manufacture these prototypes. Uh, then it was difficult to, to find, uh, not difficult but impossible to find the, the material here because this is a special 
medical material, grade 5 titanium it is called, and we here apply to our uh, very good uh, uh, graduate who works in uh, Tehran, Sevanter Sarkisyan, and uh, uh, he managed to send uh, this material for us. I should say that this uh, uh, parts that are uh, uh, that remain within the body are from titanium, and these parts that are used during the surgery are for, from stainless steel. No problem for this, but the, the, the material is found that way. Uh, and uh, the difficult difficulty was to drill the uh, this deep holes that are uh, in this part and we had to order a special tooling from England uh, drills uh, to drill this hole. So these were difficulties but uh, eventually uh, the uh, prototypes were created and they managed to finish this uh, just a day before uh, Levon uh, uh, took them to Harvard for uh, tests, and now uh, Levon will uh, just describe his uh, experience in Harvard. Uh, hello again, and thank you for the wonderful presentations. Uh, so what happened after the fabrication of the batch of the prototypes uh, is that I took the prototypes uh, to US uh, okay. Just a second. Uh, to Harvard Medical School, where we have the Nazarene lab uh, at the Beth Israel uh, Medical Center. Uh, first of all, it was a wonderful experience for me to uh, go to, the, to, to this kind of a large community of, of scholars and see a working lab, uh, because we have the ethic uh, prototyping lab here, uh, uh, the newborn lab in Armenia at IUA. And we, uh, I could uh, compare it to uh, the already working uh, Nazarene lab at Harvard. Uh, so first of all, I will tell you about our goals, uh, why I went to Harvard, and what were uh, our uh, what was our plan. Now, I took a uh, bunch of the prototypes uh, to the lab for testing. Uh, first of all, we were thinking about. Uh, Satisfying the ASTM requirement. ASTM stands for American Society of uh, uh, Testing and Materials. So what they have is a 1264 uh, guideline uh, for the long uh, intramedullary short uh, intramedullary nails, uh, but they don't have a guideline for the short nails. Uh, so we tried to use the guideline for the long nails and try to adapt it to our case. Uh, there were some problems because uh, you cannot. Uh, do, for example, three-point or four-point band testings on uh, these kind of small nails physically, uh, and we couldn't conduct the test at the lab. So we decided to uh, change our direction and try to do finite element ana analysis instead of a real uh, life test. Uh, so uh, about the test, there are two kinds of tests uh, that we want to, to make. The first one is just one-time test uh, for uh, load testing. Uh, it's basically the maximum uh, load uh, the implant can take. Uh, we could do it with a, a hydraulic press uh, by just uh, having a constant, constant displacement rate and trying to see uh, the maximum load that the implant will take before breaking. And the second type of testing is the fatigue analysis, uh, which is uh, trying to see how much load uh, the implant can take after, let's say, 250,000 cycles. Uh, how do we take this number? It's not from mid and mid air. Uh, we calculated the number 250,000 cycles from the 12 peak healing period uh, multiplied with uh, 7 days times uh, 6,000 uh, steps per day for each leg. So we get something around 250k. Uh, so, and also during the working, working process, uh, each leg, a femoral bone, takes uh, a lot of 2 to 3 times of your body weight. Uh, so we are going to uh, see if our uh, implant takes uh, three, three times the uh, average body weight of um, that particular minion or the U.S. citizen. So we decided to compare our implant 
with this interesting fact about that they already have in the market. Because if you want to get you know, FDA approval, which is the Food and Drug Associ uh, Association uh, approval, uh, you will. It will be easier for you to compare your products with already existing products and to show that uh, yours is not uh, worse than the uh, already existing product in the market. So uh, it's a versus battle for the uh, AUA and uh, synthesis models. Uh, and we will also try to do mechanical tests uh, for the cadaveric bones. What the cadaveric bone is, uh, it's uh, the bone of a dead person that you take. Uh, there are many. Uh, companies that you can purchase a uh, dead person's leg, or for example, or femoral bone. Uh, but it appears that those legs are very expensive. If you want to purchase, for example, uh, a dead person's leg for the femoral, net, femoral bone testing, you would need around $800 to $1,000 for uh, one sample. And uh, it is essential for us to uh, minimize the number of uh, the quantity of the bones used, so that we can uh, keep uh, low the cost of the testings. Uh, so it's basically uh, minimizing the number of tests uh, for trying to understand the maximum load uh, an implant can take for 250,000 cycles. Uh, all of this together is uh, going to be my capstone project uh, that I'm going to present in the early May, uh, hopefully. And uh, also about the Nazarian lab. Uh, as I said, uh, it was very interesting for me to see how the Nazarian lab works because we have the newborn epic lab here and uh, trying to compare uh, the, the, them was really interesting and uh, a mind-changing experience. Uh, first of all, uh, it was at the uh, infrastructure that they had, uh, the administrative team that was working, uh, trying to manage the projects uh, uh, and uh, still on, uh, on the go. They, they were trying to uh, make the decisions as flexible as possible and trying to fit the research groups. What if I told the research groups, uh, as Ara told us, uh, he's trying to uh, come up with things from multiple dis disciplines and even in their rooms you could see one electrical engineer, one biomedical engineer uh, and one mathematician sitting in the same room uh, trying to come up with ideas and trying to uh, come up with solutions for the problems. Uh, and one important thing is not what, as Ara mentioned, is uh, that we are not uh,